Hello, uh, my name is Jeff Rolka. Welcome to Office Hours, the live Q&A that I host on a weekly basis. Um, in the past, I have had some like warm-ups or licks of the week and stuff like that. Uh, but today, I'm actually going to dive directly in uh, and start answering some questions because it's been such a, a big week for questions and I've had some questions that I thought were rather significant uh, and I wanted to address in today's Q&A. So <clears throat> when you get a moment, if you want to ask a question, please use the chat window. Uh, on my screen, it's on the right-hand side. I don't know where it is on yours, but pop a question into the chat window and hello there, Ross. I can see that you've already chimed in. Thanks for doing so. Uh, and without any further ado, I am going to dive right in. I got this uh, via email, and uh, this is a someone who watches in Australia. I'll actually check really quick here, make sure this is working. Yeah, it is. It looks. It appears to be working. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> um, quick questions here. They were all really, really great questions, and some great questions I should say on the channel as well. So first. What should singers be thinking about slash focusing on while singing? How can we use our thoughts and the mind to relax and improve ourselves? And in fact, the, the, the first two bullet points are rather similar, um, which is what is your own opinion of an experience with using the mind to improve singing and thus relax more? So um, it's about direction and focus, and, and I believe it's on focusing on what can actually help. Um, and so for me, I focus very much downwards onto my engagement and expansion. And this serves the dual purpose of giving me a focal point, which I can concentrate on. And also, because I'm focusing on my support system, I'm engaging and it's taking care of any of the jitters and things like that because I am working on my support. So I'm very much focused down there. That allows me to calm down when I'm beginning my performances so that as I get further and further and further into the gig, I relax more and more and more and I can have a lot more freedom and just enjoy myself. Um, frankly, I didn't used to enjoy myself on stage very much, um, but with practice and learning to focus, it got better and better and better. Uh, hello, Heidi, and hello, Edwin. It's good to see you popping back up again. Uh, the next bullet point here is when you were talking about power expansion and engagement, and this is from last week's Q&A, uh, an ab abdominal lift as well, they say, how can one hold and maintain this while singing without over-tensing the body and over-tiring yourself? This is such an excellent question. Um, because I don't think I speak to this very frequently, the notion of engagement, the engagement that we want to cultivate with this expansion is meant to be dynamic. So it's not a static, I'm holding it out here and I'm rigid. It's flexible and it's supple and it changes as we ascend or descend. So that amount of lift and engagement, the overall I hate to use the word force, but that the amount of muscle tension that we're using will vary depending on the register. So as we ascend, we're going to use a lot more lift, a lot more engagement because the velocity of air over the vocal fold has to increase in order for the vocal fold to not start picking up the tension for tone production. If that makes sense, right? We want the airflow to take the weight off the vocal mechanism as we ascend. And if we don't, we run the risk of it shutting down. So what does that even sound like? Oh, I can, I'll show you, that's a bad sound for this too. Uh, I don't know if I like that, but that'll work. So here we are right around middle C, right? Hey, middle C. And if I am going to sing a line that's going to ascend past that point. I have to lift and engage and keep the air moving over the vocal fold. Otherwise, 
the vocal fold starts to pick up the tension of the tone production. In other words, not awesome. Not really that pretty, right? Because it's all vocal fold engagement, muscle tension. And when you really start squeezing it out, that's when we get breaks and things like that. So we want to lift and engage and allow this to stay loose. And that helps us stay in tune and it gets a good transition up into the secondo passaggio. This time it reminded me that the, yes, Edwin, good to see you again. Support things mysterious. Claim it exists and it helps, but I cannot get it. I don't know if you've checked out the Apoggio video or not, Edwin, but, and there's also like some lean stuff where you can lean up against a wall. That's a really good way to feel how that engagement can help to free things up. The, the thing is, is you get into the position of the lean and then you do some exercises and notice the difference. Um, that would be something I would check out. It's, I think it's called the lean. Um, uh, and you know, you and I are in contact. So if you can't find that video, send me an, an email or get in touch with the comment section and I'll send you a link. Um, I want to keep on knocking these down. How can singers practice efficient breathing, expansion, engagement when not singing just during day to day living? Um, they make, they throw some examples out at being at a desk job and stuff like that. Um, the main thing about that is going to be watching your posture. Um, so, and, and I think you're going to have to be kind of sensitive to your own individual needs about that. Um, so for me, um, I really like to sit very much on the edge of my seat. You can't see the chair in the video, but I sit very much on the end. So my sit bones are, are kind of on the edge, about as comfortable as it's going to be. Um, I'm very conscious of my lower back so that I don't sway too far forward, nor do I collapse. Um, this allows for, you know, the same kind of breathing expansion that I would have if I were singing. Um, but I don't know if it's really realistic to practice that at all times. I mean, certainly, you know, checking in with it from time to time would be really, really good. Uh, one of the, the major, major pitfalls that I see occurring a lot um, with people that work on computers a lot is the, the shoulder roll where everything kind of collapses forward. The problem here is that usually the neck comes back. Um, so keeping a nice open and upright posture, sitting very squarely, trying to feel your head upright. It's tough to maintain that posture when you're working on the computer. Um, I catch myself hunching down when I need to do computer related things. Uh, but being aware of it, and checking yourself, just moving around, maintaining that suppleness of posture and uprightness, I think would be very, very help and be a really, really good reminder throughout your day um, that relates nicely to expansion and engagement. And their last question here was, how will a soprano's voice change as they grow older and how can sopranos maintain their voices and high notes, longevity? I find that hitting the high notes is fine while I'm still young, but will this be lost in the future? Good question. Um, I have not, I have had some clients that were um, older, um, but not necessarily, you know, very aged. Only a few people that were in their 70s or 80s um, over the years. I think the mo more important thing is how we use our voices um, as opposed to how it might change over time. There's a certain amount of inflexibility that's going to occur with age, um, but keeping in good practice, so regular good practice habits that do not strain your voice, I think will be very, very key. Also, maintaining your body physique, physique as much as possible. Um, as we age, it's possible to lose muscle mass if we're not physically active, if we don't maintain physical activity. So um, whatever physical regimen you may or may not be participating in now, again, always with doctor's orders, not, not my suggestions, but with doctor's orders. Um, 
whatever you can do now to maintain suppleness of body, posture, and flexibility, I think will aid in the longevity uh, of your upper register because it's that body, that big body muscles that's going to keep your voice supple and keep you from straining your voice um, as you sing year after year after year. So great. I see there's a lot, there's been, I've been focusing on this and uh, there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, I'm glad that you can see me, Heidi. That is excellent. Support is a physical thing. No, I do not get a sore throat uh, after an hour of singing, uh, whether I've warmed up or not. Um, if you're getting a sore throat, Edwin, you need to reassess your airflow and engagement. Um, Edwin, if I remember correctly, your you do take private lessons, um, and you're not really engaging with airflow all that much in your private instruction. Um, this is almost certainly a big part of the issue. Um, proper engagement, proper airflow is crucial to keep the weight off the vocal fold. <clears throat> Greg's Life 7, vocal cord closure. Yes, um, there's a bunch of exercises that are in um, throughout the playlists, really anytime that you've got short vowel sounds in any of the warm-up videos or the technical videos. There's a lot of this stuff in the um, beginner's playlist. Not, again, not that you're a beginner, but those exercises can be fruitful for all of us. Anything where you've got that wee, 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 that sort of a thing. Wee, 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 wee. Those syllables, that short utterances of pitch, help to get the vocal fold to zip up and close properly. Um, and then you can start moving towards more melismatic exercises from there. If E is too challenging, regardless of what's going on in the video or if you yourself play, try an OO vowel. You, 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 you. That vowel naturally sits a little further back in the aural cavity. It's, it's a more of a rear focusing vowel. And that one can sometimes be a little bit easier to keep on the vocal fold and keep it closing up properly. Um, there was another thought that crossed my mind while I was doing that demonstration. Um, Yes, stay in a comfortable range. Stay in a comfortable range. Um, get this to happen on your vowel syllables in your thyroarytenoid dominant voice rather than trying to go really, really high with it at first. And then start to gradually move up into the zona de passaggio and ultimately singing over the secondo passaggio with it. Um, yeah, start start in the thyroid dominant range. Start in the chest range. <clears throat> well, Edwin, um, if that is their teaching, then they've got a plan, and I would say stick with the plan. But um, at some point, uh, I. I I think airflow, airflow is something worth studying. I don't know. You'll you'll have to you'll 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 have to talk to them and figure out what works best for you. That's a very good question. Um, but I have to assume that uh, Greg's got a little bit of air in the sound if the cord closure is not um, optimal. If that's let me know if that's correct or not, Greg. Um, that would be my assumption that you've got a little bit of um, poor abduction. You, you, you. Where it's a bit airy. We, we, we. Um, sometimes we can reach down and get that as well. Um, particularly in the lower register. Like if you're down here. We, 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 we. And you're really pushing down on the larynx to get those low notes. Um, that can separate the vocal folds slightly as well. Um, lower register stuff. Be bright initially. 
we 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 that's a, a very good reason uh greg's live seven tried a couple things but nothing so far has gotten my chords together um you know those that um there, sometimes people will, will advocate a little vocal fry or a creaky door kind of sound. I'm not a huge fan of inducing that kind of sound into our um, vocal delivery because ultimately we have, to, we have to really unlearn that. We don't want to start starting, we don't want to begin all of our phrases with that. E, we, 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 we. We, that can be a nice affectation, um, but we don't want it to be a crutch. Hello, uh, Caprents. You're very, very welcome for the high tenor videos. Please, um, this is the forum for questions and answers. So type it into your chat window there, and I will do my best. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would try the try you, and if that still isn't um if that's still coming up short for you greg's life seven think ew e w ew 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 um that will need to get pulled back a little bit um because that is quite a high vocal fold engagement kind of delivery Over supporting my upper extension was non existent from the stress. How can I get my support to be more balanced? That is a very, very, very good question. Um, over support. Yeah, that's a challenging question. That's a really, really good question um, I would work on if you if you've ever done the uh, mesa de voce exercises where you're going from really really soft to louder to soft again um, perhaps practicing that so for example can be a really, really good way to focus on how you are engaging um, and also modulating it from perhaps heavier amounts of engagement abdominally, more force, to less, and then more and less and more and less. You may also find that some dynamic exercises may be appropriate. I just noticed Heidi's uh, comment on the diaphragmatic breathing video, and the that incorporates some exercises that have you alternating between a short note and a short breath. He, 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 he. So very short note, very short breath, very short note, very short breath. That exercise serves a lot of purposes. Um, one, it can help us to balance our um, amount of airflow versus the amount of vocal fold engagement we have. Um, and it can help us dial in the right amount of each for any given range that we're in. Um, also, um, by working it at faster tempos, um, if you're really, really crunching down, if you're really, really forcing with the support, you probably won't be fast enough. You won't be agile enough to do it. And so with a little bit of practice there, um, I think you'll develop more agility. You'll lighten up your engagement somewhat. I'd be interested to have you try some of those things and then chime back in either at another Q&A or at a comment. Um, as Heidi mentioned, this, it, the, the video in question that she's speaking of is the diaphragmatic video, um, diaphragmatic breathing warm-up. It's in the warm-up playlist. Aziz, hello, how can I get gentle chord closure? 
Jane, it is working very well. Um, can you be, can you elaborate a little bit, Aziz? Um, I'm curious to know what you mean. If it's really, really hyperglottic, e, or if you're meaning like different um, kinds of deliveries in the zona de passaggio, where you're say going from like a belted sound e, to a more transitional sound where I'm transitioning into my upper register. E, to more of a counter tenor thing where I'm pulling that down a little further to be a little bit lighter. <laughs> ah, Caprence. There's no strain, but it sounds almost cry like. Long tones are always going to be, assuming that you have good engagement and good airflow. Um, you might also try some descending scales as well. Uh, I don't know if I have a warm-up where it's entirely focused on descending patterns, but they're, they do exist in there. And that can have the effect of, if we focus on lightly descending, taking advantage of some habits and descending patterns when you do that. Typically, um, we, we tend to back away from our engagement ever so slightly in a descending pattern. And it can have the effect of bringing you off the vocal fold slightly, softening your descent somewhat. somewhat. Breath compression. Uh, this is J. Uh, do you mean um, engagement? Is that what you mean by compression? Or do you mean that sensation in the uh, upper respiratory tract around the larynx where it, it, it feels connected to the voice? If you wouldn't mind elaborating on that, that would be fantastic. John, you're very welcome. Wonderful. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Okay, Greg's Life 7's got a video up for folks to listen to. Of course. Yeah, please. Um, you know, type it in there and I will do what I can do. Jay, yes. Uh, yes to, you're very welcome Aziz. Uh, I think I threw two things out there, Jay. Was it upper register or using the diaphragm? Okay, cool. Putting attention downward, groovy. Okay, Jay. Um, the diaphragm is an involuntary muscle. So if someone tells you to breathe from the diaphragm, then the answer to that is I already am because that's what keeps you breathing. When we go to sleep at night, we still breathe all night long. It's not a conscious muscle. It keeps on doing its thing, whether we're conscious or not. We have to influence its behavior by using other muscles that surround it. And that's where the apogeal breath management system comes into play. It starts with a lateral expansion uh, through the rib cage. Ooh, I don't wanna unplug myself as I stand up here a little bit. So here, if I'm neutral, by expanding laterally, it brings the diaphragm down and it gives my abdominal muscles more ability to interact with it and that gives me better support. That's where support comes from. So if you're very, very new to this, um, the, there was a breathing video I did only a couple weeks ago and it had us hissing quite a bit. So it gives you the opportunity to expand, engage. There's no pitch there. It's just airflow, but it lets you practice that expansion and that engagement. 
as you get better at that, um, you can first start doing a z sound, z, and then you can release it to E. You notice me kind of checking in here. That's one way that you can check in with your expansion, make sure you, you're getting an adequate expansion. You can also put your hands over your head. That can help expand the rib cage laterally. And that will get your body into the position that will allow your abdominal muscles more direct influence with the diaphragm. That's, that's a way to get started with it. Putting attention downward. Um, if we were talking about engagement, John, then what I was talking about was focusing here on my air column rather than thinking about, or rather than thinking purely about the notes or about what I was singing. I know that seems counterintuitive, but when I put airflow first in my list of priorities, everything afterwards gets better and I'm capable then of getting more involved in the music and enjoying myself on stage. So I always direct my energy and I direct my focus downward onto my airflow, onto my air column, so that I know I'm adequately expanded and engaged. Um, I think I've mentioned this in a video. I know I mention it in lessons all the time. Um, my order of operations is airflow, melody, and lyrics and lyrics gets broken down into vowels and consonants so one is airflow two melody whether it's a scale pattern or the melody of my song the physical you know the actual notes right then third are the vowels so I'm, I'm tracking the vowels after vowel and then I'm tracking consonants and trying to make sure that the consonants are not disturbing the line that I'm creating musically it is important to note that most of this happens in practice, not on stage. On stage, I'm relying a lot on habit and the practice that I've put into the pieces beforehand, and that allows me to focus on engagement. Let me see here, I missed a few. Uh, Jane. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed something else here. Okay, that's Edwin talking with Greg. That's cool. Other techniques besides diaphragm support that will help in ascending to the limit of your top register and not belting, but having a smooth, even tone. Jane. There are a lot of aspects to upper register technique. Um, airflow is a major part of it, um, but certainly we have to have good vowel control, good vowel blend. We have to pay attention to the phrasing, um, whether it's, again, a vocalization or it's the song that we're singing. If we're breaking up the phrase, that can keep us from getting the absolute most out of our voices. So there's lots of concepts that go into high register singing. Um, airflow, however, is one of the more foundation, foundational items that I try to draw people's attention to, just because without that, um, a lot of our options disappear. If we don't have adequate airflow as we're ascending into the upper register of our voices, then we're limited to either belting or squeezing. Uh, and those are not sustainable long term. Um, certainly not into the, the very, very high range of our voices. Caprens, you're very welcome. I send you an audio file of me singing a few short phrases to give us... Absolutely. Um, upload it to SoundCloud or um, YouTube, and you can send a link uh, via YouTube's message system. So, like, if you go to the, the YouTube channel page, and then there's, like, the About... Um, about, you know, link is what it is, the about link. Click on that and you can send a message to me. Send the link there and I'll go have a listen and uh, we'll correspond that way. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you, Edwin. Same thing for you too, Greg's Life 7. Um, 
uh, if you send that link over the same way that I just mentioned it to Caprence, um, I'll have a listen to it when we're done with the Q&A. Jake, vibrato control. That's a really good question. Um, okay, so there are those that suggest that vibrato is something that we control rather directly. In other words, if I'm singing with vibrato, um, then I am consciously making those permutations would be the argument there. If I do that, I think you'll find it sounds a little bit different. It's a little bit wider, it's a little bit choppier. Um, if I modulate airflow, it gets choppier still. And that got a little bit out of control. It even starts to compromise my ability to maintain good um, vocal production. Um, the best explanation for vibrato that I have received is that it is a dynamic relationship between subglottic and uh, and vocal fold engagement, subglottic pressure and vocal fold engagement. So, in other words, the amount of airflow that we have underneath the epiglottis as it lifts towards the vocal fold interacts with it in a dynamic fashion. And when those two elements are in a good parity, they're in a good relationship, then there's a nice oscillation that can occur. And that's what I try to encourage, um, what I'm trying to encourage people that use these videos on the channel and also my clients that I, I work with privately to achieve. So it's not a forced muscular vibrato production. It's one that develops out of a dynamic relationship between airflow and vocal fold engagement. So if that's true, then when we start to fuss with it, we're actually inducing vocal fold tension, right? If I want to sing with a steady tone, and you can hear it, I was, I was trying to only use as much vocal fold engagement as I absolutely had to, to hold my voice steady. And even a couple times in, those, in that example, it started to wiggle a little bit. This becomes kind of an issue as we get into the zona de passaggio. Because in that range, if I start to induce vocal fold engagement, then I'm risking my tone production because it relies so much on release in that area of my voice. So when I really release it, a certain amount of vibrancy to it and the vibrato comes quite naturally. And I ran out of air that time trying to hold it steady. So I'm not one that suggests a lot of control over the vibrato. I want it to resonate and flow quite freely. Um, if we try to hold it steady too much, we can get a little bit vocal fold heavy there, and that is typically to be avoided. More comments below. My screen is stopped. Yeah, twang, please. That's exactly, you know, thanks for chiming in on that, Edwin. Um, the twang the, the twang thing is very frequently used to keep people on the vocal fold and to help the vocal fold zip up, to get more closure with it. Um, but as Edwin says, that's right, we have to bring that back a little bit. And if you're not getting great chord closure, uh, one of the great things can be to alternate with a hyperglottic vowel like an E with one that typically is a little bit less so, still trying to keep it on the vocal fold. So 
for example, you might sing We, we, me, 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 me. We, we, me, me, me. We, we, me, me, me. The A vowel is ever so slightly wider than E. Pardon me. And uh, it can it can open up your um, the vocal folds ever so slightly. You could also do E with an H. E, 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 e. Although if you're already having a hard time staying on the vocal fold, um, that H could really really make it challenging to stay on at all. Uh, in the exercises I just sang, Edwin, I think I, I don't know, F sharp above middle C or maybe a G. Uh, yeah, I think it was F sharp, um, which is like right smack dab at the top end of my secondo passaggio. Um, yeah, so feel free to chime in with some more questions unless I'm missing something here. Uh, I, oh, I did miss something. Breath compression in the larynx. Uh, that's a really, really good question. Um, certainly we know too much when we start getting an epiglottal uh, a, a glottal attack. E, 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 E. Anytime we've got that, then we've got way too much muscle control and air compression happening between the folds of the epiglottis. This is where, and I know this was mentioned earlier in the chat, an H can help you with that. E, E, E. He. The challenge there, though, he, 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 is to make sure that you still um, are on the vocal fold with that E vowel. Um, one of the other things, too, that can help with breath compression in the larynx and overall coordination of laryngeal muscles and airflow and, uh, uh, and diaphragmatic support is those short note, short breath, short note, short breath. Um, that, to be successful with that exercise, you've really got to retain a fairly firm engagement throughout the course of the exercise. So what we learn how to do is we learn to retain that muscle engagement when we're taking air in or um, exhaling air and singing. And um, we just increase the overall coordination between airflow and vocal fold closure. Uh, and you can start slow with that. You don't have to go that fast. E, 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 e. And do stay engaged and lifted in that whole pause because there would be a cadence there. <laughs> Making head voice sound more natural. Mind sounds pretty exaggerated and operatic. Uh, that's a great question, Greg's life. Um, descending patterns for starters, um, the NG sound is a really great way to balance out your vowels as well, particularly the wider vowels. So if you're not familiar with that exercise, <clears throat> that's when you start with a, if you say the word like hung, and you hold on to the NG at the end, hung, you get that buzz. The, the tongue is lifting in the rear of the mouth and it's shooting all the air out the front in the mask. And you can practice that way, assuming that you're making a good uh, transition through the secondo passaggio, right? When that's feeling comfortable and you can maintain that buzz, because you know you can go two ways with this. You can go forward. Or you can come back with it. Keep it forward for now. Now 
that ring in the front mask is what's going to tie the sound of your chest voice into your upper register. And as that becomes more comfortable, drink of water. <clears throat> uh, this is what happens when you talk too much and try to sing immediately after it. Um, but as you get that ring to maintain itself up and down through the zona di passaggio, then you'll get a better uh, coloration to the vowels that are up above the secondo passaggio in your head voice. Uh, Mober, if you got a sore throat and it's persisted for three days, I would say stop singing, uh, take some time off, um, and perhaps see your ENT or see a doctor. Uh, without, I am not a doctor, and I, you know, it's hard to say because if you're singing perfectly but your throat is very, very painful, that's that doesn't sound good. So sometimes we need to rest, um, take some time off. Um, if you can't take time off, you need to see a doctor, probably. Yes, uh, what we were talking about, Aziz, is in the channel. Um, and uh, thank you for watching. Thank you all for watching, by the way. And I know some people have come and gone. Um, but thank you very, very much for watching. I really appreciate you all showing up tonight. Oh, scream singing. Well, that depends on how much vocal fold engagement you are using with your scream singing. If you're mostly doing a, a glottal fry, or like a vocal fry, excuse me, and you're in more or less your normal thyroid dominant range, then you need a lot of support. You need a lot of engagement and airflow to keep as much weight off your voice as you possibly can. Right? So you're only going to use as much vocal fry as you need to achieve the sound um, that you need for what it is you're singing. Um, I worked with a, with a lot of people singing some heavy, heavy stuff when I was back in San Francisco in California. Uh, and the main, the main thing there was lots and lots of engagement, abdominal engagement and trying to get their, um, the, their muscle control abdominally to be just as supportive as it possibly could. So they were only using um, as much, they were only using, they were using as little vocal fold engagement as they could use to get the sound that they needed. Uh, as a tenor, how can I develop more power in the lower register? That's a great question, Jake. Thank you. Um, for one, the lower register is not our strong suit. Okay, so I'm not saying that we can't have a lush, beautiful sound there, but that range, the, the, that is not our sweet spot. Our sweet spot is in that area around middle C and kind of on both sides of it expanding outwards. For us um, in the lower register, focusing more on brilliance will give us more power and presence in the lower register. So. If I try to go for a more baritone tone production here, it doesn't really work. I don't have that kind of voice. But I can be brighter. Reducing a little bit of the vocal abduction, so I'm kind of lightening up my delivery. And letting it be a little bit lighter and brighter there. And that works for me. I still don't want to sing really much lower than like a B natural or B flat if I can help it. Um, um, but yeah, our, our, our game in the low register for tenors is brightness. We're going to let the baritones have the big, big juicy sounds down there. 
Uh, yes, there is. Well, that's a really interesting question. Is there is any difference in developing high and low voice? I need exercises. Um, so there is a technical section in the playlist, but the warm up videos are really technical videos, right? Like I know they say warm up, but those are all technical exercises in the videos. And if you want to develop your high register, and this is going to sound counterintuitive, start with your thyroid dominant range. Start with your chest voice. If you have a good sound here, in other words, it's even, right? The vowels resonate and they are in alignment. That is perhaps the greatest help to having a big consistent sound throughout your range um, as is focusing on the upper register. Your work in your upper register will come much more easily for getting your focus in your thyroarytenoid dominant range together first. You got it. You, you absolutely got it. Um, but I'm going to make a note of it right now. So let me just grab a pen. I will happily do some more endurance videos. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Nathaniel. I really, really appreciate it. That is very kind of you, Edwin. Um, I thank you for all showing up. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I, this is such a fun format. It's really, really fun to get to um, kind of uh, try. The, the idea behind all this is to help you get the most out of the channel. So all of these questions, um, you know, it's just good stuff. It's good to get you guys into singing and help you kind of overcome the pitfalls because there are so many um, and it really boils down to awareness about being aware of how things are working what you're doing and then being able to you know incorporate some of the other the exercises the technical stuff um, that's on the channel and so it's great to have this you know kind of back and forth um, interplay so I can direct you here direct you there I know that there's been a couple videos mentioned uh, in this Q&A and at some point I'm gonna have to review and then maybe make like a playlist of the recommended videos from the Q&A sessions so that you can easily reference them go and find them and uh, do that kind of thing ah great question I was just about to give a shout out to sort of getting your final questions in because I'm probably gonna wrap this up in about 10 minutes. Neck tension. Um, neck tension is tongue tension. Yes, I can happily address that. Um, neither are desirable. That may seem obvious. Um, however, what are we going to do about it? Um, there are certain exercises, I think, where it comes up m more than others thing to do is to be in motion however we want to be in motion that is a rhythmical um, so for example maybe I'm doing like I know I sing a lot of these scales when I'm doing these videos but um, if I'm doing E for example e is moving and I'm moving around if you have a mirror mirrors are really good for this kind of practice because you can watch yourself and move around and things like that things to look out for is this one this is the no neck movement right <laughs> My neck isn't moving, my head is moving because my spine is being held tight. But we want to be loose here. Tongue tension is really, really cool. There's a lot of different ways you can practice releasing tongue tension. One is to grab your tongue. 
And I just did a video with this like a couple weeks ago. Um, I wanted to call it tongue abuse, but I didn't. It's it's like reducing tongue tension or something like that. But anyways. <laughs> Yes, the vowels come out really, really funny, okay? But what can happen is if you've, if you've really got um, a lot of tongue tension, your tongue will get whipped out of your fingers. And it'll pull back, and we want to keep it out. We can then transition to letting it lie on our lip. can take it into our mouths. <laughs> Letting it be right behind the teeth, just gently touching the rear of the bottom teeth. Um, another really, really great tongue tension exercise is knuckle into the side and be gentle with yourself, right? Like, you don't, you don't want to feel the roof of your mouth when you're doing that. You just want to gently get that in there. And if I have a lot of tongue tension, my, um, my knuckle will pop out, right? So if I'm singing E, and you can see that there, right? E, it's coming down. E feel the tongue root pushing on that knuckle and what you want to try and do is release that tension so try to keep the tongue at the rear as still as you can this will have the effect of bringing the sound quite far back but keep in mind this is a practice we're learning to control this tongue tension and eventually, when we're when we're singing a song or practicing for real, it may it's going to move a little bit for you, but it won't move as much, and we can be much more aware of how much we're carrying back there. I have Nathaniel. I have done some videos on harmonies, um, and some vocal runs. The harmony videos I think are in the ear training playlist. There's an ear training playlist on the channel page. If you have a look there, I think that's where the harmony videos are at. If you don't find them, uh, send a message to me through the YouTube on the about screen. You can send a message. Send me a message or send a message to me and um, I will send you some links. Vocal runs. Yeah, um, there's a bunch of videos with some different riffs and runs and things like that that are there. Um, those would be in the specialized, check the specialized scale practice, specialized scale practice playlist. I believe that's where those are. Good shout, Heidi. It's always, that is always cool. And I think these are great forums too. Um, uh, we teach best what we most need to learn. Uh, I read somewhere once a long time ago. And I definitely want to keep on learning as much as I possibly can about singing and about teaching singing. And all these questions help me do that and help me be an even better vocalist, too. Stamina and endurance are probably my biggest negatives. I will do my best. Placement. Yes. Okay, uh, so I'm going to make steve's and the i know that's not a real nickname i remember from last time j-a-p-a-d-o-g-i it's just some random letters so i'm going to make those the probably the two last questions i address because we're coming up on an hour here um placement uh, placement varies somewhat depending on the genre that you are singing so if you are doing musical theater we need a little bit more point mask is the way that it's typically referred to uh, but the bel canto trained people will think about it as point um, and then for those of us that are singing more classical material that's not as important and we may come a little bit further back all right you're very welcome nathaniel um, so for myself and for most of what's in the channel 
it is directed at placement such that we can have a neutral tone production throughout our entire register, right? So we, 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 we is meant to be balanced so that when we sing we get into the zone of passaggio it remains consistent right we want to have a neutral the ability to have a neutral tone production throughout our register changes ascending and descending and then from there we can start coloring it more specific to the genre of the pieces that we are singing so if um, you're doing theater then that may come a bit more forward <laughs> that helps with intelligibility on stage right um, for that matter, if you're singing pop rock, and you, even if you're using a microphone, that additional brightness can be incredibly helpful. Um, <laughs> sorry, the Mr. J there, uh, I saw that comment pop up and gave me a little chuckle. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, sorry, getting back on task. Got to get back on task. Got to focus. Got to focus. Got to focus. Placement. Uh, yes. Um, so, yeah. That brightness can it helps us with intelligibility no matter what we're singing, um, but it's not as necessary if you're singing an aria in uh, a small small room with maybe a harpsichord or a piano very carefully played uh, accompanying you. You don't necessarily need that kind of brightness, um, but for starters, um, Steve Stephen. Um, neutral placement and then begin to adjust it according to the genre that you are going to be uh, singing in. Is tongue so much important for larynx control? In my tongue but I still have a problem with the larynx. Does that mean that I still don't have control of my tongue? Probably. Actually that's really really astute Mr. J. Um, because there is a connection back here at the tongue root where um, the, the tongue gets integrated into the esophagus and those muscles are all connected in there. And one of the things that we really have to be able to do is to keep the larynx in a neutral or lowered position while the tongue root is free to move. So when you see all those exercises where um, they're, they're looking at the larynx and they're, you, you, you might, maybe you're watching yourself, like watch yourself in the mirror and if you see that the larynx is lifting, I'm sorry, that's a bad scale there. And the larynx is really lifting, it's going to close off the airflow. That is not desirable as we ascend into the zona de passaggio. We want to keep that open, right? So, what can we do about that? very very lightly very 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 lightly just a nice light um, touch there again in a comfortable range to start and we're just monitoring we're not there's there's no pressure right it's so super light super super light against the throat so that we can monitor and um, uh, just get some biofeedback into how the larynx is moving. Ooh is a really, really good vowel to help us practice keeping the larynx in a neutral position. So some descending stuff. You, you, you. And again, lightly feeling, lightly just touching the throat. You, you, you. You, you, you. As that gets better, try switching vowels. We, we, we. We, we, we. We, we, we. And that will help you to start getting the larynx lower. Um, it will 
tend to stay in a more neutral position as your overall airflow and engagement solidifies. So when this, when your expansion and lift um, is more supportive of the vocal mechanism, the tendency to lift will decrease. Um, but I think all of these things can work together really nicely. So a little bit of that knuckle at the tongue root, a little bit of fingers on the larynx and changing some vowels around, some airflow and engagement, and also our, our old favorite, right, the bubble, is a really, really good exercise to feel the larynx in a neutral position. So when you do that, and you'll notice the sound color changes slightly, right? Gets hollow up there. That's the sound of my larynx staying in a lowered or neutral position. We want to go for that hollow sound um, as we come to the top of that octave arpeggio. Um, that coloration lets us know that we're in the right position. All of those things working together inform us how we're keeping the larynx. And that then begins to build into a habit. Um, this is a good problem to have. I, I said I was going to cut it at an hour, and there's a lot of questions that are still remaining. But um, I am doing this every week. It is my intention to have the live Q&A once a week. And so I am certainly, Nathaniel, I want to just address that. I'm absolutely going to do um, 2 a.m. Uh, that's dedication. That's amazing. Thank you so much. And um, it is almost time for you to get a little bit more shut eye. Um, these are all, they, they all get recorded by YouTube as well. So you can always go and check them out um, on the channel. Uh, if you can't find it, send a message to me via the uh, channel about page where there's a message thing. And, and I'll find them uh, somewhere, but they're somewhere on the channel. And um, you can always reference them then if you, if you don't want to get up at 2 a.m. And maybe I, 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 had, I had it in my mind that I might start doing these at different times of day so that people wouldn't have to, you know, get up at 2 in the morning um, or just review them after the fact. So um, I'll have to give that some more thought. But, um, yeah. Uh, so, anyways... Thank you very, very much, everybody. I really, really appreciate um, uh, for uh, your participation and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't think I've actually... You're very welcome, Steve Steven. Uh, I think I've gotten everyone's questions. If I've missed something, send a message to me or a comment. Um, or show up next week because week after week after week we're going to be doing this and I just want to thank you one more time and as always take really really good care of your voices enjoy singing and hopefully we'll see you again bye